upright. I'm for you to. And I'm a little concerned. I don't know if the Harlesses just didn't try to make it this morning or if they tried and had some problems. Pray for them. They'll be all right. I'd like for you, if you will, to open your Bibles with us to the book of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. We want to take our thoughts from one of the parables we was teaching on that this morning, and I'm not going to teach so much, you know, the, the parable, because we do that in Sunday school class when we come to it, but I do want to take a thought from here. Um, that we want to expand upon. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 36, Matthew 13, 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. I've kind of been prompted once again, it seems like as we, or as I hear different things, I'm made aware that this world, this country, this world has no idea the, literally, the, the hell that is about to be unleashed upon it. Second Peter chapter three and verses three through seven gives us the response of the, the scoffers, the cry of the scoffers. It says all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Not so much getting into the scientific implications of the uniformitarianism, but the idea that the unbelievers and the, the scoffers are kind of the, the militant, uh, atheistic unbelievers, but their cry is that all things continue. In Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17 and verse 26. It says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot when they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And so one of the things that we see here that is indicative of the last day is that the attitude and the practice of the multitudes will be all things continue. Uh, in spite of the preaching that has preceded these days, in spite of the different global phenomenon that we see and hear about, people 
continue as though there is no end and that this is indicative of the last days. The marrying, giving in marriage, the eating, the drinking, but the building, the sowing, the all these things, they continue on. And, and it's like every time I turn around, I am impressed um, constantly uh, as I see the people continuing in all in their ignorance and unbelief. Paul spoke of himself and uh, the things that he did. He said, I did them in ignorance and in unbelief. And we see the multitudes today, not just here, but around the world. Now the parable of the wheat and the tares sets forth a very, in very general terms the overall struggle between good and evil, between God and Satan. And we just look at this portion in just very general terms. And one of the things that we see here, first of all, it sets forth how the evil was introduced into the world. <coughs> the original creation, according to the Word of God, was good. As a matter of fact, he said it's very good. In Genesis 1.31, when he finished with the creation, everything that he had made, it was all accomplished. And it was very good. There was no sin. There was no death. There was no decay. There was no dying. There was no suffering of any kind. Everything was in its place. It worked. And would have continued if sin had not been introduced. But we see Satan engineered, if you will, the fall of man. Notice, if you will, in Second um, Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul writing to the church of Corinth, says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The serpent beguiled Eve, and yet through Eve brought about Adam's complicity in this, which brought about the fall. Sin entered the world by one man. Adam is held responsible for that fall, but it is Satan that engineered it, beguiling Eve and through Eve drawing Adam into the sin, and therefore sin entered the world by one man, and death by sin. Therefore death is passed upon all men all have sinned. And so we see how that sin was entered into this world. We see that in this world then we have two classes of people, if you will. And I hate to use the word classes because uh, Sometimes the image that that gives, you know, of rich and poor and so on and so forth. But there are two types of people, category, that we see mentioned in the scripture under various terms. We see there are the elect of God, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Paul says here, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. God has an elect people that he's calling out. This is represented by the good seed. These are the children of God. Uh, the, said the good seed are the children of the kingdom. God's elect. 
And God is in the process of calling out his elect through the preaching of the gospel. And then we see there are the children of the wicked one, the lost, Ephesians 2. And he's describing us as those that are saved that at one time were the same as or indistinguishable uh, from the lost or the children of the wicked one. He says, and you hath he quickened, verse 1, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so here he describes... He's describing what we were once like, but at the same time it's describing the world, describing the laws and the condition that they're in. And he identifies them as the children of disobedience, uh, the children of wrath, even as others. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 3, he says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to those who are lost. Uh, the unbelieving, who are the children of the devil, the children of wrath, whom the God of this world, Satan, had blinded their minds. And we see that according to this parable that both continue together in this world to the time of the end. And, and that is the view of this parable. It's not talking about the church. Uh, it's important that we understand this because some have used this parable to teach against church discipline, which it, it's, is commanded and taught in the Scripture. And that's one of the reasons we talked about in Sunday school lesson that a right understanding of these parables and a right teaching of them, they will be consistent with the revealed truth. The church discipline and the need to discipline those who walk disorderly, that uh, have uh, obvious sin in their lives, that refuse to repent of their sin, are to be put out. Uh, to have fellowship withdrawn from them, the different terminology that is used, but church discipline is to be exercised. You cannot rightly interpret a parable in a way that is contradictory to that revealed truth. And so we see here, this is talking about the world. This is talking about the kingdom, not the church. And that they both continue in this world, we see, to the time of the end. Uh, we see, secondly here, that it sets forth that there was a time of sowing, and there shall be a time of reaping. There was a beginning, there will be an end. Uh, this parable sets forth that at the time of the end there will be a time of reaping carried out by the holy angels of God in which the wicked are separated out from among uh, the righteous. We see that, and that's the, the idea of the parable, that God knows those that are his. Any attempts to try to root out of this world the wicked since, as Paul described there in Ephesians, 
There was no distinguishable difference between God's elect before they are saved and the rest of the world. We do not know who God's elect are. Paul says, I endure all things for their sake. He said, I become all things to all men that by all means I may win some. We're to preach the gospel to every creature. But it is not our job or our task to try to root out the wicked from among the righteous. Because in doing so, you may be rooting out some of God's chosen that he has just not yet brought to salvation. I think that is part of the teaching of that parable. But God himself will do the separating. And while, again, we see that this parable is setting forth these truths in some very general terms, broad terms. The separating will take place. Um, in Matthew chapter 3, if you will, notice the warning of John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say to yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For well, I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He said, Who has warned you to flee the wrath to come? There is a time... As there had been a sowing, there had been a creation of the world, there has been the preaching of the gospel, the sowing of the good seed, if you will. There will be a time of reaping. There will be an end. There will be a harvest. You know, and the idea of sowing and reaping is used in many ways in the scripture. It's uh, is used of us and uh, how we choose to, to live. Uh, be not mocked, God is not deceived whatsoever. A man soweth, that shall he also reap. And he applies that to us in our lives. That uh, the, Concerning the types of choices that we make, the lifestyle that we choose, uh, we will reap either the consequences or benefits of those choices and decisions. But there is also, in the matter of the course of this world, a time of the end, a time of reaping, a time of harvest. And this harvest consists basically of two things. Now a lot of times, uh, and from what I understand, the, the tares was a weed, I'll try to stand still, that looked just like wheat. But it didn't bear fruit. It did not bear the grain. And so at the time of harvest, when they would reap it, when it had tasseled out and it'd be brought in to the threshing floor, where the wheat would, the fruit of the wheat, the wheat would be uh, separated from the chaff, which would include the tares. And the thrashing, you know, we, we use that term, we've come to use that term. Uh, if, if you give somebody a good thrashing, that means you beat them up pretty good. You've pummeled them. <coughs> thrashing is where the wheat 
was laid upon a hard surface, a, a stone floor, and either it was trampled by the ox or a uh, wheel was brought over it, or people would by hand, they had these sticks, almost like the, the nunchucks, only a little bit longer. They'd have a section that was attached by a chain that was flexible, and they would beat it. They had beat the, the wheat. This was called the thrashing. And as they beat it, the, the grain, the wheat, would be separated from the chaff and everything. The tares, there wouldn't be any grain on it. And so then they would separate it. The grain, thus being separated from the chaff and the tares, would be gathered into the bins, into its garden, and the rest was gathered up and cast into the fire. It was good for nothing but to be burned with fire. And this is used to represent the judgment at the end of the world, that there will be a time of reaping and separating that will take place. And it's not just one event, I believe, that we see here mentioned in the scriptures when the details of this, but we see a time of purging or separating of the wheat from the chaff. Now, the means, in, uh, as we talked about in those days for separating out the wheat from the chaff, was violently beating it upon the floor. The Bible in various places describes in more detail what the parable states in simple and general terms that there will be a series of terrible and terrifying end time events that will separate out the wicked from among the righteous and eventually gather them, uh, the, the wicked, to be cast into the fire and the righteous will be gathered unto the Lord. Uh, right now, in a sense, we see a separating through the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel in which God is calling out his elect, elect from amongst the world. And so we are preaching the gospel to every creature and those that have ears to hear, let him hear. And as God touches people's hearts, brings them under conviction, they begin to realize their lost condition and desire to become saved, desire to have the forgiveness of God, and they will uh, turn from their sin and confess and ask God for mercy and forgiveness. And so are separated out of the world through the preaching of the gospel. We see that at the rapture, those that of uh, the dead in Christ and those of us alive and remain to his coming will be called up to meet the Lord in the air and thus uh, separated from this world. Uh, this is a for us, it's not a terrible or terrifying event. This is what we as God's people are looking forward to. We desire uh, that time when the Lord will return according to his promise and come back for us and receive us unto himself that where he is there, we may be also. And so we desire and look forward to that. Uh, to the world, however, that may come as a terrifying event with the disappearance of the people, the implications that that disappearance may have, whether they understand the truth of it, that this is the Lord that has returned and raptured his people out, therefore that means they're left behind to go through the tribulation, or whether they prefer, as most will, to believe the lie that will be told, whatever that may be, uh, but there will be a strong delusion that they might believe a lie. Uh, but it will be terrifying nonetheless. I believe that people will see something at the rapture. You know, the Lord comes in the air with his angels. How close he gets, I don't know. But it talks about the glory. That is the brightness, the shining, the glory, something that is glorious, it shines brightly and it compares uh, to
to the glory of the sun or the glory of the moon, the glory of the stars, which we can see in the heavens. And sometimes even uh, the glory of the moon is bright enough that we can see it in the daylight. And there are some stars that are bright enough that we can see them while it's still daylight out. And so it compares us and our glorified bodies in glory to these heavenly bodies. Uh, so when we receive our glorified bodies and we go up to meet the Lord in the air, I'm sure there's going to be something visible that people see. <coughs> now see, the, it's going up. The idea that is described in the scriptures in, I believe it's Ezekiel, and it talks about these angels, and there was a, a visible phenomenon present with the angels the wheel within a wheel within a wheel, the way that the angels move, the way that the wheels move, fits perfectly the descriptions and things of flying saucers. Now, I don't believe that the... I believe people have seen flying saucers. See, why do you believe it? Because I saw it. Brought daylight. My grandmother and I and my Uncle James sitting on their front porch there in eastern Kentucky saw so watched four of them fall the ridge line right in front of us in broad daylight. Uh, so you know I, I take but I don't believe they're extraterrestrials. I believe they're exactly what the Bible describes. A phenomenon, visible phenomenon seen that's associated with the presence of angels or demons. So whether or not this is part of the lie, the strong delusion that is given, and, and if you, there's flying saucers present, you know, that people see in the sky, and lights going up, and people disappearing. It fits some of the stories and things that I believe have been setting up. Satan has been setting the stage for this for some time. Whatever. That's speculation on my part if you will. But the idea is, for us, we're looking forward to the rapture and the coming of the Lord, but to the world when it occurs, it's going to be terrifying. And then the real terrifying stuff begins. The tribulation period mentioned uh, in Scripture, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. And let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down uh, to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field turn back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. So he's speaking of a time, and the world has undergone very great uh, times in the past uh, of, of tribulation, if you will. There have been times of the Black Death, the plague that came through Europe. There have been, you know, all sorts of things, devastating things, earthquakes and famines and pestilence and one thing. But he said, this is a time, there's been no time like it in history up to this time. It is a one-of-a-kind time that it, hard to compare it to anything else. It's a great tribulation. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And he goes on. And then it says in verse 29, I want us to get this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Uh, and then it says, now learn the parable. We won't get into the parable. But we see these great end time events in which God is separating out through here we see through a series of judgments through death he's going to be separating the wheat from the shaft uh, the earthquakes violent eruptions hail fire there are many things described both here and in Revelation and in other parts of the scripture there's a verse of scripture I don't know exactly where it is but I remember it sticks out in my mind from the study I did years ago about these end times and said that he shall arise to shake mightily the earth that the earth shall stagger to and fro like a drunken man and you imagine because the result of all of these things, one of the results will be a creating once again the uh, surroundings as it was in the days before the flood. Before the flood there was a canopy of water vapor above the atmosphere that acted to shield the earth from harmful rays of the sun and to create a greenhouse effect to evenly distribute the heat and the warmth around the world to give the moderate, you know, the, the temper temperatures uh, around the world. And we see that in the millennial kingdom such a time exists once again. And I believe one of the effects of the traumatic events of the tribulation period will be to recreate those conditions in which a water vapor is once again the, oh, the water that came upon the earth during the flood is still here it's in the oceans and the seas but the descriptions that the scriptures give which I believe are literal when it talks about the mountains will fall down flat the valleys will be lifted up the islands will be moved out of their places there will be a great traumatic earthquake and what can cause that you know one of the things you know they keep talking about they're fearful that some asteroid is going to strike the earth there may be something like that in the uh, events that we read about that would create the effect certainly the pollution in the air, the atmosphere created by dust, created by volcanic eruptions and, and things like this will be throwing ash and all, which will cause the sun and the moon to be darkened and for the, to have that reddish blood color that is described in the scriptures. The things that it describes is the, the third of the sea being turned to blood, the third of all the life in the sea dying. A third of the ships being destroyed, the third of the trees being burned up, and all green grass and all the fresh water, a third of all the fresh water being polluted and poisoned, where the men die. Uh, even a third of the population of the earth being killed as a result of many of these things. And yet the world, in spite of this information has been here for 2,000 years. Some of it much longer. And in spite of that and the things that we see happening around us, people continue. All things continue. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the, right up until the time that God removed the righteous and judgment began to fall. And, and see, these are the things, and it even uses in the book of Revelation, it's talking about the angels with the sickle and reaping the earth. Uh, the time described here as uh, 
the sun being dark and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven the powers of the heaven shall be shaken well our perspective of the heavens right now we have a very steady solid platform on which we stand we can look at the stars and they look pretty steady but if the ground beneath us is moving it's going to cause our perspective of those things in the heavens to move and it's not the heavens so much as being shaken, but the earth on which we're standing is being shaken. Uh, but all these things come back. But the book of Joel describes this. Joel chapter 3 and verse 9, as it describes the, the last days and the leading up to the battle of Armageddon. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will... I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get ye down, for the press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Notice in Revelations chapter 6 as he opens the sixth seal. Verse 12, and I beheld, and he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. The heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Let's talk about the same thing. Who hath warned thee to flee the wrath to come? In the coming the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, also the Lion of the tribe of Judah is how he will come. The King of kings and Lord of lords is returning to claim his own. And we see other, the other events in the Bible, the Millennial Kingdom, the Battle of Gog and Magog, fire come down from heaven to destroy them, the Heavens and earth, the creation which now exists, will be destroyed by fire as described in 2 Peter. The final judgment of the lost, the wicked, Revelation chapter 20. Be not deceived. These things are upon us now. Time is running out. And that's what in Presbyterian Lou was talking about. She was reading, uh, was talking about there in Gethsemane. They have the geysers. It's a huge volcanic volcano there, deep down. It said if it ever erupts, it would split the United States. You know, we hear more and more about these fault lines. One of the largest fault lines. If people talk about the San Andreas, San Andreas Fault in California, one of the largest fault lines in the United States and North America runs right down the Mississippi River. Follows the fault line right there. And a branch off of that is the Ohio River. And they sometimes have earthquakes in Kentucky, Ohio, in this vicinity because there's a huge fault line there. The, the earth is covered with these fault lines. 
And, and these things are more and more in the news. Sinkholes, earthquakes. Think what it would be like when the Lord arises and to shake mightily the earth. What that is a great earthquake and the things that follow. All these things. Jesus continues to invite people to trust him, to come unto him. Matthew 23, 37. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stones them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. You know, he, Jesus shows himself here standing ready to receive those who will come to him. John 6, 37, And he that cometh to me, all that my Father giveth me will come to me, and he that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's the separating that we should partake of is that which he is doing now through the preaching of the gospel in which we are saved and translated of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Let us stand together.